and welcome to our service. During this time of what passes for normal, we're delighted to welcome you to our special services each Sunday evening. It's our hope and prayer that as we meet together in this way, that we will be encouraged and blessed. Let us worship God. Lola is now going to lead us as we talk to him in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we all join together at this time in the one spirit, we wish to honour and uplift your precious name. We thank you for your presence and we thank you, Jesus, for your great love for us. You displayed this love ultimately when you went to the cross and took the penalty for our sins upon yourself. We praise you for the resurrection and we know you are now interceding for us at the right hand of your Father. We recognise you defeated Satan and death itself at Calvary. We thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit, who is our comforter and teacher. We exalt you for the freedom we have to read your word, and we thank you for the technological advances which enable us to have our worship services despite our social distancing presently. Father, we thank you for our minister and our church family. We express our appreciation to you, Lord, for our NHS and all who work in it. We are also indebted to you for all our other essential services, including retail, security forces, teachers and farmers. We pray for your protection for them. We thank you for our families, our homes, your provision of food and even for our very next breath. In Psalm 91, Lord, you have promised that you will cover us with your feathers and under your wings we will find refuge. Thank you for all your promises and help us not to be afraid. Nothing can separate us from your love as we are united in Jesus. Your word encourages us to pray without ceasing and we have the assurance that you hear our prayers. Finally, Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy towards us and for the wonderful anticipation of heaven when we depart from this life. Amen. Our Bible reading will now be brought to us by Janet. John 20, verses 19 to 31. Jesus appears to his disciples. On that evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing 
you may have life in his name. The story of Thomas is the story of so many of us. Having missed the resurrection appearance of Jesus with his disciples on that first Easter Sunday evening, he responds when told of these events by the other disciples that he needs proof. Now we can be very unfair to Thomas. After all, he wasn't asking for anything other than what the disciples had received. And yet, at the heart of his refusal, it's clear that he simply wouldn't accept the version given to him by his friends. How did he get into that situation? And what lessons are there for us in our day? The first thing that we notice is his isolation. Now, there's no reason for his absence. We are absent from each other because we are forced to be apart. His was different. It might have been accidental, but John describes him as one of the twelve, and that suggests that his absence was intentional. It was deliberate. It was a conscious act on his part. And it's reasonable to suggest that because of what we know about Thomas, this seems to fit with his character. Our situation is different. Our absence from one another is not because we wish it to be so, but because we do not have the opportunity to meet together. Why would Thomas want to be separate from his church family? Well, he was at heart a very pessimistic sort of a character. He says way back in John chapter 11, let us also go that we may die with him, that is with Jesus. He's a bit of a tendency to look on everything as negative and as black. He's a bit like Private Fraser in Dad's army, who often declared, we're doomed. And on top of that, he was someone who was quite impatient. Whenever Jesus told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them, he replied by saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going, <clears throat> so how can we know the way? And he spoke to contradict Jesus in this. It's almost as if he hadn't listened to Jesus. He wanted to get things done as soon as possible. And yet, following the resurrection, when his life had fallen apart, the divisive tendencies of his character began to show themselves. So when the other disciples met together, he was nowhere to be seen. And even when encouraged by them, he still would not accept what they said. Instead, on that first Easter Sunday evening, he went off to brood by himself. Someone put it like this, he went off to hug his despair. He went to separate consciously from his fellow believers. And when he did so, he was the one who lost out on this. For when they received the sight of the Lord in his risen glory, he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Would he not have been better off with them in the upper room? In the same manner, would we not be better off, yes, in each other's company, but we're better off when we're able to meet together at least in this way. It is to us a blessing and an encouragement. For although we are separated from each other, we are grateful that we can commit ourselves to gather in our own homes, 
knowing that our fellow believers are also gathering, that when we do so, we come together to worship the risen Christ, to meet together at our appointed time to praise Jesus. The worst thing that we can do when disbelief or doubt or coldness comes upon our hearts is that we would blot out the light, that we would go away, that we would shut ourselves off from others, from those who care for us. The best thing we can do is to do what we're doing, to meet together, if only in prayer or in watching an online service together. We need the fellowship of the saints. If a fire is going out, we pull the coals together to the middle of the grate so that they can encourage one another and that the flames can return. We need to be very conscious that in our isolation, idiosyncrasies can grow. But when we commit to one another, that mutual fellowship, encouragement and blessing is part of what it is to be the people of God. So when Thomas was told by the other disciples what he had missed, his response was one of incredulity. His response in that sense wasn't unlike the other disciples. They had been told by the women, and presumably Thomas was among them at that stage, that Jesus was alive. They didn't believe the woman's message until John and Peter ran to the tomb. We're told that John believed, though we're not told what Peter thought. Thomas responds in like manner to the disciples. He didn't accept their testimony. He wasn't doubting Thomas. He was disbelieving Thomas. The very form in which he puts his requirement shows how he was holding on to his unbelief. For he said this, in effect, he said, unless I have this, then I will not. It's not a case of, if I have, so then I will. He doesn't want to be persuaded. He is determined not to be. He couldn't lay down obligations to God. He should have understood from his fellow believers that Jesus had risen and he should have given thanks for this. But he was prescribing the terms of his surrender to God. He was trying to withhold his assent to prove that he was in charge. He was trying to say that he was responsible and not God. He wasn't doubting. He was actually rejecting the message of God. So what did God do? Well, God imparted to him a revelation. In his grace and mercy, Jesus Christ came to Thomas. But in doing so, he rebuked him. The NIV says this, what Jesus responded to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. But literally it says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Because what Jesus meant that it wasn't a matter of evidence as a question of the inclination of his heart. It wasn't that there was insufficient evidence, but that it was the attitude of Thomas. He had been told by the ladies who went to the tomb He had been told 
by the other disciples and still he would not believe. Because faith is about trust, belief and acceptance. There are two influences at work in our lives. One or the other will take hold of us. We can either cultivate a habit of mistrust and incredulity. That will lead us to descend into frustration and faithfulness, faithlessness. Or we can cultivate a habit of trust, of assurance, that we can depend upon God in his grace, knowing that he's in control of all things. But when Jesus came to Thomas in a gracious and merciful manner, Thomas understood. He realised that Jesus had risen from the dead. He was struck not only by the fact that Jesus had risen, but also by his own foolishness and his own sinfulness. And therefore he responded in the only way appropriate, where he said in verse 28, My Lord and my God. For the word of God had penetrated into his very heart. It brought him to realise that it was in Jesus that his hope was found, not in himself. And we need to understand and hold on to the blessings that we have received, even in this time of separation. Because the object of our faith remains the one and same, Jesus, who has risen from the dead. He is revealed to us in Scripture. The message of the disciples is the message to us. And the call is the same call as Thomas was given. Indeed, it was the same call that all the disciples received. That is, to trust in the risen Christ and in his finished work. Because trusting in Jesus delivers us from trying to depend upon ourselves, upon the things that we can see or do. Because when we look at the things we can see, all we can see is fear, illness, disease, separation. But the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that, as Peter says, even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So although we are separate from each other, no longer in each other's company, we give thanks that we can still meet with the risen Christ to know his blessing and to know the joy of fellowship with him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the whole world is linked together in this pandemic. It doesn't discriminate between nations or peoples. We pray, therefore, for our world, that there will be a unified effort to bring this situation to a conclusion. That there will be provided a vaccine or some other means sooner rather than later that will mean an end to this terrible illness. We pray, therefore, for wisdom for those who must take decisions, for governments and those in authority. And we pray as well for our own local government, that you will bless them and enable them to take decisions which are for the welfare of the people of our land. We pray too, O God, that you will continue to enable those who seek our welfare to be blessed and to be a blessing to us. And to that end, O God, we pray for the safety of all, from the oldest 
to the youngest and to the unborn who are now regarded by many as not worthy of life. We pray, O oh God, for the needs of care homes. They have been in our news bulletins quite regularly during this week. They face difficulties and we pray for them, for those who look after frail and older people, many of whom have got particular needs. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will protect them and bless them in the days ahead. Father, we also know that restrictions on movement will have consequences. We pray for those who are suffering distress, anxiety or fear because they cannot get out of their homes or because they are concerned about whether they will contract this illness. We pray, O oh God, that in Jesus Christ they will find rest and peace. We pray as well, O oh God, that in the midst of this pandemic, for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will enable them to reflect upon the reality of life and death and be prepared for any and every eventuality. We pray, O oh God, that you would reveal yourself to them, just as you did to Thomas. And Lord, we ask that in the continuing circumstances, you will watch over us and that you will keep us safe this night and in the days to come. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are going to worship God together and encourage you to join in as we sing to his praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you this night and forevermore. Amen.